and welcome to Evolving Events, where we are celebrating people in the event industry who are doing really innovative things during this time of lockdown and pandemic. I'm Hannah from the Venues and Events Department at the Cheltenham Ladies College and we have an array of beautiful spaces available for you to hire for your special events. So today I am really thrilled to be joined by Jude Kelly, CBE, who is an award-winning director, champion of women in the arts, um, and has held artistic director posts at Battersea Arts Centre, West Yorkshire Playhouse, and uh, the South Bank Centre more recently. Um, and for the past 10 years, Jude has been the founder and the director of Women of the World Foundation, um, which has been holding festivals globally um, for the past 10 years. So it's a real pleasure to chat to you today, Jude. Nice to talk to you, Hannah. Um, so how about you kick us off telling us um, what, what was going on in uh, Women of the World pre-lockdown at the beginning of the year? What did you have planned? So WOW is, a, as you said, a set of festivals and events that happens right across the globe in 30 different countries now. Um, and its main function is to bring girls and women and boys and men of all different backgrounds together to celebrate the amount of progress we've made in terms of gender justice and, uh, and intersectional equality, but also to be very candid about what's still to be done. And there's a lot to be done in all different ways, in all different kinds of countries, in all different kinds of cultures. Uh, and these have always been live events. And they've been an opportunity for all kinds of people to do speeches and talks and pop-up displays and arts activities, um, sports activities, um, marketplaces, a, a part of our, our work, etc. So you can imagine they're very live. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody from eight-year-olds through to sort of 90-year-olds flock and, and kind of enjoy this idea of a festival atmosphere in which you can discuss human progress. So we did a huge festival um, as an example, in Rio with 92,000 92, people in November, uh, we also do sort of tiny festivals in places like um, uh, Catherine, an Aboriginal community in Australia. Um, and then we did a, 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 one of our big festivals in London in March to celebrate International Women's Day uh, with, again, thousands and thousands of people. And that was March the 8th and 9th and 10th. Just two weeks before lockdown in the UK, we sort of just got under the wire. Mm. And... Um, and then, of course, bang, everything closed. So we felt amazingly lucky to have gone live in the way that we did. But yeah. immediately we thought, actually, we knew that the history of crises generally is that women disproportionately um, impact, you know, get, have, are, have been impacted by, by crises. And COVID was no exception. Mm -hmm. And women of colour, uh, more disproportionately disabled women more disproportionately and of course all the issues about domestic violence i mean there's so many things to discuss about what lockdown and covid has created and the economic damage and what that will do for girls and women mm. so we just thought well we can't just sort of sit here and wait to for reopening and immediately we contacted the bbc and said look we would like to reach out to millions of women straight away partly to keep you know, resilience and stamina through celebration and partly to kind of focus in on what COVID and its issues are. And they'd work just as quickly as we did. I mean, within, we went from naught to Zoom, like within weeks, because none of us had been online experts and still aren't really. Mm. Um, but we put together what was a really exciting festival six weeks later um, for the Saturday and Sunday. And we'd already decided before that that once we'd done the BBC, which is kind of a UK festival, we would go global. And we planned um, with our different you know, festivals around the world that we would create this 24 hour marathon um, going across, you know, as the sun changes, we'd, we'd go with it, finding out from all over the world how girls and women were dealing with lockdown, COVID, and the economic crisis. And it was a sensational experience, Hannah. I mean, it was unlike anything we've ever done, not just because it was all online, because literally millions of people who would not have been able to access live events were able to join us and join in and feedback and so on. So it was, um, it was a really big learning curve. And of course, you know, this whole thing about mother being the uh, necessity, being the mother of invention, mm. it was necessary for us to build skills really quickly that we have always meant to kind of get on with, but we hadn't. Yeah. Um, 
it was necessary to think about how do we reach out um, in a time of crisis and and make new alliances and new partnerships. So, so it's been a blessing, even though the circumstances have been hard. Yeah. And it's quite a good opportunity for people to appreciate what women and people of colour and um, people with other sort of um, complications in their life are experiencing in other cultures. So where the, the festivals might have happened in isolation across the world, we now have access to see um, what the WOW Festival Africa would have looked like or what the WOW Festival in, in Australia. So it's it sort of broaden our horizons as well. So that's a good... Absolutely. And it does mean that you can have a really in-depth conversation between Malaysia and Australia and, mm. uh, you know, Nigeria on, on, as you say, on like, well, how are, how are women with disabilities dealing with this or how are women entrepreneurs dealing with loans or lack of loans? Mm. So it's, it's, um, it's really great global knowledge. And because we're not, we're not an academic institute, you know, we're not doing sort of academic research, although we join with academia to, to build on their research. Um, we're also building friendship groups. We're mm. bringing voices from the margins into the center. Um, we're, because we're very, very intergenerational, we're about to do a convening of girls in October, um, bringing girl leaders from around the world to talk to each other and, and see what their um, choices and, and 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 ideas have been during this time so we're you know it's, it's motivated a whole new energy as well yeah. as we're still doing live because we we are still planning live events of course you know mm. we're assuming that there'll be a post-covid moment we don't know when it will be yeah. but we are we're assuming really that from now on we will always be hybrid i mean we'll always include now i think a big online dimension because the issue of access is so clear yeah uh, however there is also a startling fact that you can't avoid which is the digital access there's the kind of digital divide is yeah. made even more frightening because as people have no choice but to be online those people who for lots of different reasons can't be they haven't got mm. actual access uh, they can't afford to be for very long or they're not allowed access they haven't got enough, you know, that, that, I mean, if they're living in circumstances and lots of girls and women are where they, they, they haven't got the authority to be online, as it were. Yeah. Uh, as well as being time poor, which is another huge thing for them, mm. then, then that throws up a lot of issues about, you know, about the rights that we are giving people and but also excluding people from. Yeah, absolutely. And um, from your experience of, of um, changing so quickly to a virtual event and putting something on within six weeks, what sort of um, tips and um, experiences did you learn that you think would be valuable to share to other event organisers? Um, well, I think, first of all, do a lot of research, you know, talk to lots of people. I and mean, that's obvious. But, you know, as this sort of whole zoom online world has accelerated so quickly opportunistically a lot of people are quickly going to be offering packages and stuff etc and it's worth just checking all the different ways that people have done things mm. because i'm a great one for believing that we should um if we can do it ourselves and have as much control as possible it's better i mean a because you learn more and B, because you're not kind of in the hands of situations where you, you feel powerless. And a lot of women in particular are kind of made to feel they have to be blinded by science and technology. So I would say to women in particular running events, try to, try to, to own the method of doing it, not just the content in some way. And certainly at WOW, we are now offering other people the chance to use us. You know, we can now platform people, we can vision mix, we can do those things because we taught ourselves and we're training mm. other women to do it and, and young girls as well. Yeah. So I would say try to own your means of production if you can, or at least be on top of all of that. Um, we went just in terms of, of connection. Um, we now have a, it's like a team meeting or a Zoom team meeting every single day. And we find that the level of connection, since you can't meet live with our partners as well, it, it really needs you. 
to turn mm. up for each other. You know, you've, if you can't do live meetings, you need to turn up for each other on a really regular basis, just so that you can get past that transactional stuff and remain or, or build a kind of friendships, partnerships, trust, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, because also, you know, language is treacherous. People think they know, they think they talk about the same thing and they just go, well, they're not really. Yeah. So you have, to, yeah. you have to put time in to unpacking descriptions people give of what it's going to be like, or we're going to do this. I've realized that, you know, we're really not telepathic. Yeah. <laughs> and we often think that we know what somebody else means. So yeah. I can't stress enough how important it is to keep on digging underneath. What do you really mean? What do you really want? What do you, what do you imagine this will really look like? Who yeah. are you really trying to reach? And then there's another thing which I think is worth mentioning, which is code of conduct. Mm. So, I mean, this applies in live events as well. But when you've got thousands of people maybe listening in, or, or even if it's a closed community, people can say stuff online, which we know from Twitter and we know from Instagram, which is careless. Yeah. You know, it's necessarily badly intended. It's just careless. And I think that people have got to set up in front Okay, what, what is our language going to be around I inclusion? Or like what, what are the things we're going to speak of? And who's facilitating how much, you know, do research into what's that person's history of dealing with certain issues? Because life's complex, as we know, and um, you can suddenly find yourself in the middle of a storm and you can avoid it. Yeah, yeah. And even more important, because you're not getting that live re reaction from the audience, are you? It's, it, it's going it, out there and you're not getting an instant. Yeah, because live response. events, you know, someone can raise their hand and say, sorry, I want to take issue with that. Mm. Or they can say, did you really mean that? And then somebody can go, oh, hold on, let me put this another way. But you can't do that online. So mm. you end up just like it's fixed in aspect, whatever you, you said or they said. And it can be so dangerous, yeah. as we can see. We like we can see this as the world is touchy yeah yeah and understandably so people yeah. have reasons to be you know very concerned about language and attitude so we, you have to be meticulous yeah absolutely and because they're also recorded um you know people are people are watching them back whereas a live yeah. event the moment's gone and people think well i might have misheard that or misinterpreted it and yeah exactly. dangerous yeah. dangerous so looking to the future, um, what do you have planned for um, your next WOW festivals? Um, you know, I know you've mentioned about hybrid events being a big part of it, um, but where do you see them for the rest of the year and going into 2021? Well, all our partners across the whole world are doing um, online events. We're doing quite a lot of, we're experimenting with very local things, like how do you really build a community of, in a very local way? I'm fascinated by that. You know, can you get 30 women from a housing estate to all go online together and share? And, and you know, how do we build hyperlocal? Because I think this is a kind of a key thing going forward anyway. Mm. Uh, what's shown us, shown up in COVID is that people really need community. So how does that get strengthened online? And then, so we're doing a big day of the girl, which is the, you know, the day of the girl is the 11th of October every year. And we're doing a, a big convening of girl leaders from around the world. And also we're doing a, a, sort of a, 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 a conference on the Friday that is for schools. Hmm. Uh, and that's interesting, you know, just putting together an online conference that's going to work for schools in different ways. And then we're putting together a lending library of material that people can borrow, particularly again for girls, about girls' actions, girls', girls projects, all sorts of things, so that they can form their own, like, almost like book clubs to discuss to, to build curriculum mm. um we're planning the march international day of the girl if we can be live we will be live around the world but we will also definitely be online too so that we can find a way of partnering in sort of all different kinds of networks yeah. um through an activity we'll we're building up a lot of pre-recorded material because once we you know we realize that obviously with, with 24 hour we were able to pre-record, you know, the um, ex-finance minister of Nigeria because she couldn't do it any other time or the head of the UN women. We could, but so we've got that material. So we're going to do a lot through the year of pre-records. 
Mm. Um, and then um, we also did a lot of, of recording of women musicians, mm. uh, women poets. So we're, you know, we are going to build up stuff, if you like, so that the live event is not perilously built on mm. everything working and everybody being in place and everybody staying up till two o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, which is what, what, what most, some of us did. Uh, but on the other hand, what, one of the things I did discover was that people can definitely tell the difference between a pre-record and a live, even if you don't tell them. Yeah. It's weird. There's something that people can tell. And I like that. I like the fact that humans can still instinctively understand, oh no, this is, this is real. This is now. Yeah. So I, I we should, I don't think we should ever get too prepackaged. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a lovely experience to be having live virtual conversations with people. It is. It is. I mean, it's what yeah. you know, people on, on radio often say is that even though they can't hear feedback or see their listeners, they know they're there now. And that yeah. does change your uh, kind of performance as a, 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 as a person, I think, in the yeah. space. Absolutely. Um, so one last question, Jude, before I let you get off. Um, what one thing would you want to keep from your lockdown experience? And it doesn't have to be work related, it could be personal. Um, well, I'm, I'm living by the sea. So I have, a, you know, a unique, well, not unique, but I have an advantage in being able to say, I'd, I'd like to live, I'd like to be able to look out at the sea every day, <laughs> but which I wasn't in before lockdown. Because I was always because I lived more of the time in the city, and mm. I was racing around all the time. Mm. I mean, I, I think you know another way to put it is that there's a tranquility that some of us have been able to have in lockdown. But I do want to stress that that is not the case if you are homeschooling, you know, two or three kids mm. and trying to do your job and trying to do caring. So. I'd like to keep the level of the tranquility that I was able to find. Mm. But maybe a better way to put it is I'd like to share it out a bit more with a few other people because you're very aware that COVID has demonstrated who has and who has not. Yes. You yeah. know, we have this phrase, we're all in it together. We're mm. not all in it together. We're all in it, mm. but we're definitely not together. Yeah. And as Rebecca Sultan has had this phrase, you know, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And yeah. I think that's something that I've become very, very aware of throughout this whole period. Yes, yeah, it has, it has that definitely opened divide, you know, enhanced those yeah. divides and, and some people have had, um, you know, a really, really difficult time of it. And others have sort of, you know, chilled in their garden on furlough and, and managed to make the most of it. And yeah, it does, it does sort of highlight those gaps in society. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you so much for chatting today, Jude, and best of luck with um, the future WOW events. And I hope that they all go smoothly and, and return to um, a, a sort of hybrid or uh, live version at some point. Um, and if you want to get in touch, um, then we'll put the websites below here. Um, and you watching at home, if you'd like to give the video a like and a share and um, spread Jude's work. Thank you very much. Great to speak to you, Hannah. Bye-bye.